Hey guys, welcome again to another online experience here at Pinnacle Church. We are glad you're connecting with us. We are in week three of a series we started where we are looking at the basics, those basic things that we need to believe about Christ, about our faith. Uh, what do we at the end of the day should believe if we are going to call ourselves Christians and, and follow Jesus? And and so today we're going to go a little further than that. And as I think about that, uh, you, you guys ever heard the old uh, old uh, Christian joke, kind of funny statement about the uh, mother who asked uh, her son, said, what did you learn about in Sunday school today? And she would ask him every week and he'd say the same thing. What did you learn about in Sunday school today? And he'd say, sin. I learned about sin. <laughs> And, and actually, that is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about sin. And I know that is a, that can be an interesting topic to talk about, especially in our cultural moment, because for some people, uh, they think that when a Christian or a pastor starts to talk about that word, uh, that we maybe are trying to restrict some of their freedom or something. But we're going to see why in a minute that's not necessarily the case. But I've noticed that when it comes to sin, uh, sometimes what we will do is, I have people ask me this, I think every pastor does, uh, Andy Stanley, who we took some of his stuff for the series, he, he said it as well, that uh, people will ask him, they'll go, is blank, fill in the blank, a sin? And what we really mean by that is we're asking the question, can I get away with this? Is this acceptable? Is this allowed? And so what we need to do today, because we are taking about basic beliefs, is we need to define exactly what sin is, the effect it has on our lives, and why it's important that we understand and, and actually do something or allow someone to do something about our sin. Now, as I said, I know when we talk about this, sometimes people in this modern moment uh, will say, well, when you Christians talk about sin, all you're trying to do is restrict people and, and stop them from being free and all that. But I actually believe, here's the issue, is that when we allow this thing that we call sin to rule our life, we actually are not free. We actually are enslaved and we think we're being free, but we actually find ourselves not free. And we're gonna see why that is in a moment. And so to do that, we're going to look at two different places in Scripture today. First, we're going to start with a, a verse in Romans. Romans was a letter written by the Apostle Paul to Roman Christians. And in it, it it's he, uh, he talks about salvation, what Jesus came to do, the state of humanity. And then half the book is application of how we live out the gospel, the good news of Jesus. But there's a place there, Romans 3.23. Listen to what he says here. He says this, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Now, I want you to notice something there, right? He kicks off and he says, everyone has sinned. So that, that one tells us the scope of this thing that Christians call sin is that everyone is born sinful. We come into this world, it, it's a part of human nature. You know, you have the old argument, are humans basically good, are humans basically bad? But but we are, we come into this world sinful. And it says everyone, that's the scope. Every man, woman, child, we have this in us. Um, here's the thing, I want you to think about this. We are born into this world, there's, there's a statement I like to use, called radically depraved. Humanity is not utterly evil, but we are broken, all right? So what, what we mean by that is that we come into the world with this nature, this bent to to sin, to rebel against God. And, and in that, uh, it doesn't mean that every single human is fully, truly evil, okay? Though there, I believe there have been humans like that, Hitler, right? Uh, but, but we are broken. And, and, and in our brokenness, in our sin, it, it tells us something. That, that word sin means, it's an it's a archery term in Greek. It means to miss the mark. It means we're off target. And our nature is to be off target. And, and, and how? Well, if you look, he says, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Some translations say we fall short of the glory of God. But it, this is a good translation. It means that. We are falling short. It means we come up short. It's like we're in a race and we, we, we can't finish it on our own. We, we miss the target. We fall up short of what? God's standard. 
And that's where we come in and we have to understand what is God's standard? Because that's where the question comes in. Is blank sin? Well, here's how we're going to look at it. If you go over to Matthew chapter 22, because remember, what we're doing is we're just looking at uh, the words of Jesus. We're seeing how Jesus defined things. And in Matthew 22, and you start with verse 36, uh, Jesus is going to tell us what God's standard is and how we sin when we break that standard. Verse 36, Matthew 22. He says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, uh, this, this was a, um, a guy, a Pharisee, you can read in the, earlier in the context of the text. This is a student, someone who studied the law. The law would have been uh, the commandments, over 600 commands that the uh, Hebrews at the time of Jesus would follow. We find it in the, in the Old Testament writings, in the Hebrew Bible. We, we find it in the, in the Torah, in the books of Deuteronomy, Leviticus, those things. It was how they separated themselves from the people around them and lived to honor uh, the God that they worshiped, Okay. And here he's saying, there's over 600 commandments. What's the greatest of them? And look at what Jesus says. And if you've been around Pinnacle a lot, you've heard this one a lot, but we gotta, we gotta be reminded of it. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So there it is. Jesus is like, you want to know what the greatest commandment is? You want to know what all the other ones are, sort of, are pointing to? He says, it's this right here. He's saying, you love God. We are made to love our creator, to follow him. And he says there with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Basically, you look at those three things, it just means the totality of who you are, that the, pri the priority of our life not just for pastors or super spiritual Christians, but for everyone that, that we should make God the Father, God the priority of our life. He's the center. Th that's how we were created. And so if we go back and we think that sin then is a failure to follow God's standard and this is the greatest commandment, then think about sin from that perspective. It's a failure then, first and foremost, to live up to this. Matter of fact, I'll give you one definition. We're going to build on this. It's this. Sin is building your life and your meaning on anything, even a good thing, more than on God. You see, what we do is we replace God in our life with idols. Now, I know when I say that word idol, uh, some of you in your mind are like, <laughs> don't do the idol thing, man. You, you think about like people bowing to statues or you think about uh, in the pagan ancient world, all the different temples and the Greek gods and the Roman gods and goddesses, and they would bow to these statues or created things. And you're like, man, I don't do that. But here's the thing, an idol can be anything that, that we put in our life that replaces God in our life. An idol can be anything that we try to find ultimate meaning in, uh, functional salvation, if you will, in this thing. And it can run the gambit. It can be a relationship. It can be um, an attitude. It can, it can be a culture. It can be a race. It can be a job, it can be all kinds of things that we place in the, in the throne of our heart and our life and it supersedes God and our life. And you see, and, and I'll say that and sometimes people will still hear that and be like, well, I don't do that, but, but think about it. Every one of us does that at some level in our life and that is sin. Timothy Keller has a great quote. It's, it's, a, it's a long quote, but I want to read it to you. Uh, listen to this. He says this. Sin isn't only doing bad things. You see, a lot of times we think, well, sin's just doing bad things. It is, but it's more than that. He says, sin isn't only doing bad things. It's more fundamentally making good things into ultimate things. Sin is building your life and meaning on anything, even a very good thing, more than on God. There's your point I gave you. Whatever we build our life on, here it is, whatever we build our life on will drive us 
and enslave us, sin is primarily idolatry. Because what it does is when we sin, we're making a choice to go against what God has said is good and right for us because God is not there to to straightjacket our life, but to actually give us freedom to flourish. And ultimately what we do is we're rebelling against our creator and we say, nope, I'm not going to listen to you. This is better for me. And in saying it's better for us, we actually try to find things in our life that we think will give us ultimate meaning. And when we put these things, whatever these things are into our life that we think will give us ultimate meaning, then and we think I will be free in this, they actually become a driving force in all the different ways we act and the things that we do, and ultimately they enslave us. You know, it's 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 one thing, and we should do this to to watch our behavior, okay? And to deal with behavior. We need to do that. But more fundamentally, we've got to get behind the idolatry, get to the root of the idolatry that's behind that behavior. And that's why, you know, we look at this, and I say first and foremost, when we replace God with something in our life that is trying to give us ultimate meaning, minus the only one who can give us ultimate meaning, our creator, then that's sin. But Jesus is going to go on in this verse too, though. And look at what he says in verse 39. He says, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. And when he says, and the second is like it, he's not saying second in importance. He's saying second in sequence. These two things go together. And he says, all the law, all the prophets, basically everything you read in the Hebrew Bible Uh, Haynes, it's simply application of these two things. Jesus, there's a a scene when after Jesus Christ is raised from the dead and he's uh, walking, these two disciples are walking on the road to Emmaus, these two followers of Jesus. And uh, they don't recognize who he is, but Jesus um, meets them on the road, interacts with them, walks with them. And he says this very important thing over there in um, in Acts. He says, uh, because they're all distraught about what's happened, you know, and they tell him and, they're kind of like, have you not been around? You know what's happened? They just crucified Jesus. Ah. And he says, um, he tells him, he's like, all the, all the scripture, when he, he reveals himself to him, he says, all the scripture points to me. Everything we read about in scripture, old and new, points to Jesus. And here's the thing. When Jesus said these two things, when he said, love God with all your heart, soul, and your mind, your neighbor is yourself. When he said, all the law and prophets hang on this, I believe that as you look at the words of Jesus, the letters in the New Testament from Paul and Peter and James and, and John and Jude, when, when, you, when you look at all that stuff, right, it's simply application to these two commands. It tells us how to live this out. And there's something we've got to get here, okay? Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. That, that, the love that I have for myself, and I know sometimes we can have self-loathing and self-hatred, but the standard there is we're to love our neighbor. And Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount would, would take, someone would ask him, who is my neighbor? And he would tell the story of this good Samaritan. He would say there was a guy uh, who fell into bandits on the road, and uh, he would tell the story about how a uh, a person would come by, a priest would come by, another person would come by, and they'd leave him on the road. And then a Samaritan, and for Jesus to use that word Samaritan, Samaritans were hated by the Jews. They were seen as half-breed idol worshipers. And, uh, but the Samaritan helped this man. And Jesus would ask the person, say, well, who was the neighbor? They would say the one who helped him. And Jesus would say, you go and do likewise. Jesus would quantify who's your neighbor when he would say, bless your enemies, bless those who persecute you. Show love and grace and mercy to your enemy, all right? And so that's the standard of Jesus' love. Why? Because he loved you and me when we were his enemies. You did nothing to deserve Jesus' love, and yet he still loved you and went to the cross for you. And and so we got to understand, there is a, a vertical us to God dimension, but there's also a horizontal us and people dimension to our faith. 
And when Jesus ties, love your neighbors yourself too, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, it means our ability to love others is a reflection of our love for God. You can have all the theology in the world, okay? You can have right doctrine. You can know scripture well. You can be like, man, I love God. I'm all about Jesus. I'm all about the Lord. I'm for the church, man. I stand up for truth, right? You can have all of that. But if you suck at loving your neighbor, that is all meaningless because the two are tied together. And so that means there's something else we've got to add. Not only is sin replacing God with something else in our life, sin is also this. It is a failure to not love people like Jesus loves them. And, and man, that, that changes the game, doesn't it? it? Changes the game for me. Because anytime I open my mouth, anytime I put something on social media, anytime I write an email, anytime I say anything, anytime I share anything, I have to ask myself, am I loving my neighbor? And I'm speaking to the Christians now. I know some of you are not there yet, but I'm going to speak to the Christians now. And if you like to walk around with that fish on your car and you like to taunt your Christianity and make the post that I'm standing for Jesus, that's good and all. But how are you loving your enemy? How is how you're saying it? Are you loving? Think about it. I mean, just think about it. We often try to define sin as what those people out there are doing, but maybe we need to look at what we're doing. So that brings me to this. We need to say basic belief. Basic belief number three, what is sin then, right? Sin is this. It's replacing God with anything that harms me or harms others. You got to think about it that way. You come from the thing of, am I replacing God in my life with an idol that then causes me to run after, to do things that ultimately not only harm me, but then bring harm to the people around me? It's in that relational context where Jesus said, you love your neighbor as yourself and you love God with all your heart and your soul and mind. And so that is sin. It begins with the idolatry in our heart and it leads out to actions, behaviors, and attitudes that not only hurt the people around us, but also then brings ultimate harm to us. Because I know sometimes people will push back and say, well, I'm doing this thing in my life and it's not hurting anybody else and I don't think it's harming me. But, but ultimately, if we are are replacing God in our life, we're running after the idols that our heart makes, then we ultimately are harming ourselves because we are not flourishing in the manner in which we were made. And that's something to think about. And so if that is true, then we got to say, okay, man, what do I do with this, right? Well, I think there's two things that we have to do. We have to repent and we have to replace Repenting means to turn. There's a place for repentance. The repentance is where I acknowledge this attitude, this behavior, this thing that I'm doing uh, is, is not right, it is wrong, and I acknowledge that. And then not only do I acknowledge it, though, because I can always say, man, God, that's wrong. I, God, please forgive me for this. But the next day, I'm going to go right back to doing it. To repent is, God, I... This is wrong. I throw myself on your mercy and your forgiveness, but I'm also going the other way. I'm done. I'm laying this down. And so we repent, but not only do we repent, but we also have to replace. Because if the, if the root of those behaviors we repent of is an idolatry, something in our life that is acting as a functional savior, driving us to these behaviors, we've got to replace that idol with a greater vision of Jesus. Paul in, um, in Colossians would talk about setting our minds on heavenly things, things above, looking in. And, and what we mean is, and this is a lifelong thing of us pressing in to the truth and the beauty of who Jesus is. It's, it's basically, I get to the point where I, I'm replacing my idols with a renewed heart, vision, and love of the gospel and of Jesus. And I say all that, right? And, and the way you get to that point is you really got to ask yourself a question. And I think we all need to be asking this question. 
what's operating in the place of Jesus as my real functional salvation and Savior? What's driving me to do what I do and act the way I do and to have the attitudes and the minds and the thoughts that I have in my life? Am I being driven by, by Christ or am I being driven by something else? So it's something to think about. And here's the thing. If I just left you with that to do that on your own, that would be crushing because you and I are incapable on our own of living up to God's glorious standard. Romans 3, 21, everyone has sinned. But that's where the beauty of the gospel comes in, the good news of what Jesus has accomplished on the cross and through his resurrection. Jesus then, because of a relationship with him, enables us to have the ability to have a renewed vision of him. He changes our hearts. He changes our lives from the inside out and gives us this ability to lay down those things, to change those things, to walk away and to replace those things in our life that ultimately cannot fulfill us and will enslave us. So that's why it's so important then to turn to Christ. And I know we hear that and you may say, okay, man, I get all that, but I'm just still not sure. You know what? Okay. But here's why it's so important, okay? Keller, Tim Keller, in his book, The Reason for God, he, he, he drills down on this and he talks about the different things that we replace God with in our life. And I want you to think about it. This is why it's important for us to get this and, and to truly repent and replace. Here's why. Think about it this way. All the different ways we do this, all the different things we center our life on other than our Savior. Think about it. If you center your life and your identity on your family and children, which we do, remember, we take a good thing and make it an ultimate thing. All these things are good things, but we make them ultimate things. So if you center your life and your identity on your family and children, you know what will happen? You'll try to live your life through your children. How many times do we see this? How many times have some of us done this? And you know what happens when you do that? They grow to resent you or they have no self of their own. Or at worst, you'll abuse them either physically, emotionally, mentally when they displease you. You you make the center of your life, your identity on your work and your career. Do you know what'll happen? You'll be a workaholic and you'll end up being a boring, shallow person. At worst, you will put your career before your family, and one day you'll be sitting there going, what happened to my family and my friends? And if your, go, if your career goes poorly, if it, things are going well, your self-worth is good, but when your career goes poorly, do you know what happens? You get depressed. You center your life on money and possessions. Then you'll be eaten up by worry or jealousy about money, it'll drive you. You'll get to the point where you're willing to do unethical things to maintain a lifestyle, which eventually, Keller says, will explode in your life. Some of us, we center our identity on, on pleasure, gratification, comfort, we just want to have a good time. We're like eat, live, and eat, live, and have be merry because tomorrow we'll die. That's that's our thing. But you know what happens when we do that? We get addicted to things, all kinds of things. And then what happens is we get chained, enslaved to strategies to try to help us escape life. And then we avoid the hardness of life. And that's really no way to live. You center your life on identity and your identity on relationships and approval because some people, that's what it's all about. I I need other people to approve of me and accept me for me to be happy or I'm going to put all my, my meaning and fulfillment in that one person, that true love. You know what happened? Anytime you're criticized, you'll be immensely hurt. You'll always be having drama and losing friends and you'll fear confrontation when it needs to happen. You'll fear confronting others 
And at the end of the day, a friend that's not willing to confront a friend in love is a useless friend. You center your life on noble causes. I'm all about the next noble cause, the next thing, the next mission, the next, you know, whatever. And that can be, that can be political, social, you name it. You know what happens then? You divide the world, you divide people into good and bad, and you will demonize your opponents. And when you demonize your opponents, you can't follow the commandment to love your neighbor and as Jesus quantified it, your enemy as yourself. And what happens then is ultimately you are controlled by the very enemies you demonize because without them, right, you have no purpose. Think about that. And finally, you know, you're like, okay, I don't have none of that. But we can also try to, we can replace God with religion and morality. And we find our identity in how well, how, how good I am, how moral I am, how religious I am, how, how often I come to church, how often I, I follow the commands, but you're, you're doing it for the wrong reason. And if you do that, you, you, and if you're living up to your moral standards, then you become proud and self-righteous. And we've all known people like that. And, and proud, self-righteous people become very cruel. And if you fail, if you're not able to live up to your moral standard that's always a moving target for people like that, you walk around with guilt that is crushing. Now think about all those things I've said. Every one of us at some point in life in different degrees and, and, and places on a spectrum can fall into any of that, right? But the remedy for that is Jesus. It's to put him in the center of our life to find our identity and our meaning in him. You want to defeat the sin in your life, the sin that you replace God with that causes harm to yourself and other people? You got to deal with the idols. You got to deal with that thing that's taking the throne in your life that you're chasing hard after that you think is going to give you fulfillment, happiness, and purpose and ultimately will leave you crushed. You've got to deal with that and you deal with that by turning to Jesus, the one who loves you, who saves you and only saves you but calls you into living a relationship with him that gives you purpose and meaning and fulfillment that all the other things that though they're in their right sphere are good but when made ultimate, can turn out very tragic. We need Jesus. He's our antidote for our sin. Let's pray, guys. Father, as we just slow down and pause now to think about this, God, I, I pray that we would uh, hone in on that question. What's, what's in the place of Jesus in my life? And what do I need to do about it? Some of us, God, as we're sitting here, we've got some, some things, hidden things in our life that we'd be so ashamed of if others knew it. And it's really being driven by whatever idol we've placed there. Help us to get serious about it, to deal with it through your grace. If repentance is needed, let us repent and then help us to look to you to fulfill us. And some of us, God, have been listening to this message today. If we're honest, we, we, uh, we're not quite there yet with Christ. We're not a follower of Jesus. But maybe today as they see that the center of life should be you and not these other things, uh, help, help those dear people to walk closer and make a step towards you and possibly become your follower today by accepting you as Lord and submitting to your leadership. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.